Hello and welcome to this week's episode which is going to be very different from what we normally do. If you remember last week we told you that I was preparing a presentation for the Royal Photographic Society of which I've been a member for the last 10 years. The travel section of the RPS had invited me along to talk about my photography specifically photographing different cultures and how we can be empathetic towards those cultures. So what you're going to see today is the whole presentation recorded live and I think it's going to be an interesting one for you guys because there's going to be a lot of photographs that you will not have seen before and it also really paints the picture of our journey from Turkey all the way to here in Indonesia. So uh, sit back and enjoy. I thought I would start off with this image which was actually a submission for my LRPS and uh, it's a picture I took in Mumbai because it sums up essentially what I want to discuss today which is to talk about the relationship between us as the photographer and our subject. More specifically what I wanted to talk about was how we break down those barriers between us and our subject and so I plan to do that by recounting some lessons that I've learned along uh, my travels that have given me the confidence to get up close and personal uh, with the subjects but perhaps more importantly to actually try and understand the people that we are photographing. Because I think as tourists, as you say, Kath, one of the things we're conscious of is not wanting to offend the people that we're photographing. So I want to look at you know, how we go about earning that trust. This is a, a photo that uh, I took very recently, for example, which was in the, uh, the little village of uh, Bima which is on an island called Sumbawa. It's a big island, it's just next door, next door to us. Uh, this was actually part of a, um, a project that I, that I did. Uh, this is another photograph I took. I kind of asked the question, how is it that I'm able to step into this person's backyard and take this kind of photo without offending people? And of course, there, is, there has to be an understanding of cultural norms and acceptances here. So how do we learn these? How are we able to get intimate um, into our subject, but without them noticing us? Which, unfortunately, is something that I failed to do on this shot, because if you look closely, you'll see that the lady lurking in the shadows uh, caught me just as I was pressing the, uh, the shutter there. And then in this photo here, we can see what we see quite a lot of, of course, is children playing up to the camera. So how do we avoid doing this? Maybe we don't want to. These children, by the way, uh, they live in the famous Dobi Ghats in Mumbai, which is a very big uh, laundry service. You can see the washing bars behind these kids. And actually we befriended them and we walked around with them and they showed us their tiny little classroom, which is just out of picture to the right there. So here, obviously, we are leveraging that uh, friendship that we are, are building as we uh, walk around these places. Another question I always ask is, in Indonesia, how do you take a photo of a local person without them pulling the peace sign? Which is something that happens all the time here. It's a fun photo. It's not what I was asking for, really. It's not what I really wanted. But anyway, what I'm finding is, is that as I'm traveling and sailing, I'm developing my skills both as a sailor and also as a photographer. And along the way, we you know, we're having some real standout moments, which is affecting my photography. This is the uh, Bajau Laut, they're called. These people are affectionately known as the Sea Gypsies, and they live off the northeast coast of uh, Borneo, in uh, Malaysian Borneo, that is, in the coast of Sabah. And in fact, in this particular example, we were told by the authorities not to photograph them, but we went anyway, and we took them food, and we took them medicine, and we even gave them some clothes as well. You can see some young chap got Liz's baseball cap, which I'm sure one day he will grow into. But these encounters, some of these encounters have had a real impact on how I've taken photos. And I guess there's, there's a very simple analogy with me learning photography and learning sailing. Very simply, of course, when I first started out, I was just bumbling along, making mistakes. And uh, over time, of course, I developed confidence and I developed confidence both in my photography and in my sailing. 
So I'm going to be looking at how I've been able to transition from basic snapshots to shots like this, where I'm bit taking time to compose pictures in unfamiliar places. This, by the way, was taken in um, Udaipur. So these encounters have taught us some valuable lessons, and I think they've manifested themselves um, you know, through my photography. It would be an insult to say that these are secrets. I think these are just common sense. What you'll find is that I keep referring to is that a lot of it is all about attitude. It's about your own attitude and how you hold yourself. And I'm hoping that by talking about some of these standout moments and some anecdotes as well, we can shine a light on how to take travel photos with empathy and understanding of our subjects and, and learn a bit about their culture and their way of life. Uh, a bit like the, uh, the Limbu people pictured here who live in North Sikkim. So the plan is to break this up into three sections. My journey broadly breaks up into three sections and so we'll do that with the presentation. But I thought just before we, before we start, I wanted to give some context about where we are now. So I've been living on a sailboat with my partner Liz for the last 18 years. Uh, this is a photograph of one of our first ever sails in front of Bodrum Castle in Turkey. I obviously didn't take the picture because I'm behind the helm. Esper, the sailboat Esper has been our home now for 18 years. We've lived on her full time and it's essentially where I have discovered, developed and refined my photographic skills. It is also where we edit our weekly YouTube videos and our podcasts as well. Here's a very crude map of our journey. The, the map itself spares all the repeat visits, by the way. But essentially, we started off in Aegean, Turkey, around the Greek islands. And after three years in Turkey, we then headed down to Egypt and transited through uh, the Red Sea. Now, this was at a time of piracy. This was in 2009 and 2010. And this is when piracy was at its highest. Um, we then went through the Gulf of Aden to Amman, crossed over the Arabian Sea and landed in Mumbai went down the, uh, the west coast and spent three years in Kerala, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. After that, we headed south to the Maldives. Uh, we then made a failed attempt to cross the equator, turned round, headed east, and we went uh, towards uh, Malaysia. And it's basically the last 10 years now we have spent in Southeast Asia. Now, this is pretty slow going when you consider that most people take three years to circumnavigate the whole globe, uh, in 18 years, we've only done one quarter of it. But really the reason why Liz and I are so slow is because we just like to take our time and you know, we like to absorb the cultures that we, we come across. For example, this is a photo I took recently. Uh, as you can see, it's a woman and she's drying anchovy. The question is, where does the anchovy come from? How did it get there? And we're gonna look at that a little bit later because it's, um, uh, this project that I was working on sort of demonstrates how we get to those answers beyond the basic snapshots. So trying to get an understanding of her environment and her culture. Here's just a quick photo I took recently. This was a project I called John Blow Lane, which is the name of the street I took this on. This guy happened to be kneeling in front of his doorway when I walked past him. So I just nipped over and I put my flash gun between his legs, stepped back and took a photo. And it's the kind of photo that I would never have dreamed of doing when I first started out. So how did we get to that level of interaction with the local people? Just to sort of give you a little flavor of what we do, I thought we'd just show you a very um, abridged clip of Liz and myself visiting a particular island. It's just a very short clip. So I just wondered if John, perhaps, if you are there and could maybe uh, play the, the video for us. Living on Esper is our life and the sailing can be exhilarating, but meeting people and absorbing new cultures and different perceptions of the world is the real adventure. For us, visiting the places where we drop the hook is what cruising's all about. In the middle of the Flores Sea, lying roughly halfway between Darwin, Australia and Indonesia's capital, Jakarta, lie the Salaya Islands. The great thing about photography is that it's an excuse to go walking and get in among the locals. Today's aim was to do some street photography, but it seems I wasn't the only person wanting to take pictures.
go first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's um, taking the selfie? Yeah, have a look. Uh, what's your name? Your My name, name is Riska. Liska. Riska. Riska. And you? Samira. Samira. <laughs> okay. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Jamie. True street photography is about being invisible in order to catch those unposed, decisive moments. But as hulking, sweaty white tourists, we become the centre of attention, so that tactic has to go out the window. Instead, we concentrated on getting some nice street portraits. <laughs> Invariably, we were starting to attract attention. And when children are involved, all rules go out the window. If you don't take control of them, they'll run amok. So time for some direction. Yes. <laughs> At this point, we'd only been walking for half an hour and already we had 14 budding guides to accompany us. Three quarters of an hour in, and we can now count 17 children. No charts of uh, any surreptitious photography here. It's all posed. You've got to play along with the crowd. Can we get some portraits? <laughs> By the time we got to the end of the village, we had 20 kids with us, but there were still more photo opportunities. Uh, well, I wanted to do some street photography which is normally unposed well it is it's unposed but with 1,000 children following us it's very difficult to do that so instead we've turned it round and used them as our um, scouts so these guys have been running around and they've actually been telling us what to photograph and they've they've pulled some things out of the bag actually I've got some nice photos I think based on what these young children are telling us to photograph so uh, Tira Makassi thank you Uh, it really just was showing a little snapshot uh, of us walking around the village and it was actually photographic uh, specific. So it was just us walking around, uh, chatting with some of the locals and basically just having fun with the children as well. Um, what the video doesn't show you is when we stop and chat with the local people, get invited into their houses for coffee, invited for dinner, which invariably happens on these occasions. So. We didn't see that in the video, but one thing is very definitely evident, and that was the amount of children that we always attract wherever we go. It, uh, it always happens. But uh, anyway, it, it was really just to demonstrate how responsive and welcoming these people who we'd never met before, uh, how they are with us. They're just very, very positive people. What I'll do now is I will just quickly tell you what I'm planning to do, which is to break this up into three sections essentially. The first section is going to be our fraught passage from going down the Red Sea and into the Gulf of Aden. And this is when piracy was at its highest. And in terms of my photography, I was really only starting out. So really at the risk of showing you some very technically imperfect snaps, I apologize, like this one, which was taken off the Amani coast. There are a few good shots, but I'm going to just show you some just really to illustrate our journey and also to highlight some of the anecdotes um, along the way. The second section is going to be looking at our trip through to India and uh, beyond all the way up to Thailand, actually. Um, now, this is where I started getting more seriously into my photography, um, but it's also where Liz and I spent more time getting to know people. We weren't in a rush, so we were able to just slow down and absorb the cultures. And then, of course, we end up in Thailand. And some of you will know that, of course, we spent a whole year in a Thai fishing boatyard, uh, which was a real cultural experience. No prizes, by the way, for guessing where this shot is from. It is, of course, uh, Jaipur, the pink city. Um, but we're going to take you to some more off the beaten places as well. So we're going to try and avoid some of the cliches. 
The third section is just a short section towards the end. And really what I hope to do is just to show you some of the more project based work that uh, we've been working on, like this one, which is from a fishing village called Ejok, where not only we photographed this fishing process here, but also went to visit a school, which was a, a real cultural delight. I guess the first place that we start is where we started our journey, and that was Turkey, uh, where we spent three years. Now, I have to say, it doesn't actually amount to much in terms of photography because I was just getting started. And really, when I look back through my photos, it's lots of sunsets and a lot of photographs taken from the boat with sails. So many of them, I really won't try. I'll try not to bore you with those. I do just have a couple just to show you, just to set up basically my first anecdote. While we were in Turkey, we met a lot of boats who had traveled up through the Red Sea. Now this is a notoriously difficult passage. Um, so you can imagine, uh, you know, a lot of people are very tired and exhausted and their last port of call happens to be Egypt before they come into the Mediterranean. And unfortunately, we heard so many stories of bribery and corruption, and there really weren't many positive things to say about the Red Sea. But meanwhile, Liz and I were heading the other way and we were full of trepidation. We were nervous. We were aware that there were piracy issues. Uh, so we got together with a group of few boats and we traveled together in a rally under the ridiculous notion that we would have safety in numbers. I'm not entirely sure that was uh, a well-founded thought, but anyway, we got together with a group of people. And our first port of call was Port Said. I just Put this photo in here. This is the kind of thing that we see from the boat when we come into busy uh, shipping lanes. Uh, you know, we see this a lot on our travels, but for us at the time, this was our first time that we had seen this kind of thing. Bear with me, I'm about to get to my first anecdote. Um, because it was in Port Said where I had to get to an internet cafe. Um, so I took myself outside my comfort zone for the first time, got off the boat and started wandering through the back streets of Port Said, looking for an internet cafe. And I went into this young local lad and he spoke in English and he said he would take me to an internet cafe. So we walked these back streets for 10 minutes or so, chatting along the way. And eventually we got to this internet cafe. Of course, because of all these stories I'd heard from these sailors in, in Turkey, I started rummaging through my pockets and handed him over some money. This was his backsheesh that I felt I should be paying him. And in a split second, I realized I'd completely insulted him because he stepped back and he just said, I don't want your money. I just, I just want to help you. And uh, that was my very first stark lesson uh, in my travels. The first one was, of course, learning to remove myself from my comfort zone. Um, obviously, we were doing this on the boat, but now we were doing this on, on land as well. Port Said was a very foreign place as far as I was concerned. But I think the bigger lesson is that, you know, the world isn't as scary as we think it is. Uh, and more importantly, there are people out there who are genuine and, and friendly. So the lesson really is to take other people's opinions uh, of people and places with a pinch of salt and I think really to experience it yourself. And the other thing as well I was noting was that I wasn't experiencing the same things that these other people were. My, my experience was different. It seemed to be more positive. And I think that has a lot to do with attitude and outlook. I'm hoping that's something that we can talk about a little bit later. But in terms of my photography, I was picking off easy targets, um, children, uh, market traders, that kind of thing. So I'd got over the first hurdle, which was to remove myself from my comfort zone. But I think armed with my camera, I was still very shy. And there's a certain awkwardness about my photography at, at this point in time. Anyway, we had a further thousand miles to go down the Red Sea before we could exit out the other end. And it took us to a lot of interesting places. This is a photograph of Esper at sail at the top of the Red Sea. But I should emphasize the point that piracy was on the increase every month we moved south. You may have remember there was a, an English couple called the Chandlers and they were taken 
at the same year that we were entering into the Red Sea, they were taken down the other end and were held hostage in Somalia for 13 or 14 months. So for us, this journey was a means to an end. It wasn't a sightseeing trip. We had to get through and out the other end as quickly as possible. That said, there were some very interesting places that we went to. Um, back in 2010, Sudan was just one country and we entered into the port town of Suakin. Now, this was once upon a time a luxurious medieval coral city, an entire city made of coral. Sadly, uh, coral doesn't make very good building materials, so it lies in ruins today. So a lot of the local people have moved away from the coral city and they've moved to sort of more low-lying uh, single-storey houses like this one, which was taken just down the road from the anchorage that we ended up in. I'm not entirely sure we officially checked into Sudan. We just handed over $10 to a man called Mohammed in big white robes and we were allowed to stay. Uh, unfortunately, it's somewhere I wish we could have stayed longer. We were only there just to provision, but we did manage to slip in a quick trip to Port Sudan. There were so many photographic opportunities there. A very busy city, um, but once again, I kind of missed a lot of the photographic opportunities because I was just shy. I was just so conscious of pulling out my camera. I just, I didn't know, you know, how these local people were going to react. And then this happened. So you maybe have to see in this photo, I'm trying to take a picture of the lady in the red contrasted against all the men in their white robes. So in my usual style, I quickly pulled the camera up, took a quick picture and tucked my camera away again before anyone would see me. But this time, the lady in red spotted me and my cover was completely blown. And she looked at me, she giggled, and then she turned to all of the men you see pictured here and she shouted something at the top of her voice. And to this day, I've no idea what she said, but all of those men you see pictured here turn round they all looked at me and they laughed and I laughed back. And in that instant, this barrier that I felt that I had just suddenly dropped. That instant with the lady in the red taught me that there's no point in lurking because I think as a foreigner, you, you, it's just impossible to be invisible. So you have to embrace that fact. And you do that by being positive, smiling, nodding, saying hello. And what I tend to find is that uh, smiling is almost always reciprocated. Almost. Uh, these are some lads that uh, I took a photograph of in Suakin. And in fact, they had been playing football with a stone, which is one reason why sailors are encouraged to carry um, toys, pens, pencils, that kind of thing. Anyway, the, uh, the lady in red gave me a new confidence and I will forever be grateful to her. So back in Suakin, uh, I, I had a bit more confidence. I still wasn't technically perfect. This shot I like, but it annoys the hell out of me that I've cut off the tires of the vehicle. So not technically brilliant, but I was learning to just slow down. And as you can see, um, standing in front of these people, they'd already seen me. In fact, I'd probably taken a photo of them with them looking at me, let them get on with their business and just carried on photographing them. So I was just becoming a little bit more aware of, uh, of my environment. And uh, this is the last photo I took in Sudan. It's of a butcher. And again, it's a straight portrait shot, but it was just, uh, you know, I find I, I was getting that confidence now to, to stand in front of people. Sadly, just as I was getting into the swing of the things, we, uh, we had to move on, unfortunately. The next country is Eritrea. When we visited Eritrea, it was the second poorest nation in the world, according to the United Nations. Um, it has a very deep and complex social and political history. Uh, it was um, colonized by the Italians in 1889. It became a British protectorate until the 1950s, and then it became a constituent state of Ethiopia. And when we arrived, we arrived in Massawa. Now this is where the Italians landed and spread. So you can see evidence of Italian architecture all over Eritrea. Um, but if you look closely, you will see that this building is bullet ridden. 
And these are the remains of the uh, Eritrean War of Independence, which basically raged for 30 years and finished in 1991, which was exactly two decades uh, before we arrived there. So basically anyone over 20 would have been around during the War of Independence. And it's quite possible that these gentlemen here pictured drinking their tea uh, may have fought in the War of Independence. Unfortunately, I can't confirm that because I hadn't yet got to the stage of sitting down with local people. I think if I had taken this photo last week, I almost certainly would have joined them for a sweet tea. But I was at least making my presence known with my camera and uh, really just walking around the main streets, down the back streets, and of course, as we find, children naturally gravitated towards us. More encouragingly, parents didn't have a problem with us photographing their children. And I think it, it helped that we were taking an interest in their lives. You know, we actually walked into the residential area and I think they actually appreciated that. It's not difficult to, to get off the beaten track in, in Masawa um, because there, there basically is no tourism. Um, at the time, I didn't really consider myself a travel photographer. I was just happy for anyone who posed for the camera. I was just quite happy to take a picture of them. But we definitely didn't get any sense of animosity. That's one thing that we didn't feel, um, either as a tourist or as a photographer. I remember one afternoon walking around Misawa, uh, walking through all these bombed out Italian colonial buildings turned around the corner and I found these three ladies having tea. They giggled when I turned up. The lady on the right was plaiting the hair of the lady sitting in the middle and the lady to the left was making a coffee. As soon as they saw me, not only did they start laughing, but they instantly offered me a coffee. And that kind of juxtaposition never ceases to amaze me. Here were these three women in the second poorest country in the world uh, just sharing, wanting to share with a complete stranger, you know, what little they had. And uh, that is something that both Liz and I uh, are forever sort of surprised by. This is a lady from, uh, she's actually from Somalia. She was a Somali refugee. She was escaping Somalia. And it turned out actually she, she did speak very good English. And she was just saying that she needed to escape and... Uh, basically run away from the problems of piracy, which is turning Somalia into a completely lawless state. I should say though, if you find yourself in Masawa, I can definitely recommend the hot, sweaty bus journey, 2000 odd meters to an elevation uh, to get to the capital of Asmara. This was another place that uh, people hadn't spoken too kindly about, but when we got there, we fell in love with the place and we just spent a great day just wandering around uh, the back streets, then walking onto the main streets. And it's again, it's a mix of Italian colonial coffee shops and fruit and veg markets. So just before we pushed on, after leaving Eritrea to go to the uh, Babo Mandeb, which is at the bottom of the Red Sea, uh, Liz, unbeknown to me, had submitted this image to the Sunday Times travel supplement and they selected and printed it as their travel photo of the week. And this was the first time I had ever had anything printed, recognised uh, or published. I have to say, this enthused me no end. I was very grateful for Liz of doing that. However, our concerns at the time was the very real threat of piracy. And as you can see by this photo, as we came into the Gulf of Aden, we were frequently joined by the Naval Task Forces. And in fact, there was a piracy attack that happened only 30 miles just up the coast there. And I heard the conversation between the skipper and the Naval Task Force uh, on the VHF. And I have to say, when I heard the skipper say, I have to go, they're climbing on board, my stomach just turned. Uh, that boat was a successful boarding by the pirates and it was eventually taken off to Somalia. And the way pirates, work back then was they would have a mothership over the horizon which you couldn't see and they would use small skiffs just like this one uh, which would go out and they were very quick because they would always have two outboards on the back and they'd go out scouting for potential uh, victims. 
So every single boat that we saw as we traveled through there was a potential threat. Little bit unfair to tag these guys in on that. This is just an example picture. These are actually Amanis as we were coming into Amman. Uh, but just before we got to Amman, we did end up in the port of Aden. And after all this stress, it was actually a real respite getting to Aden because at the time it was a great place to be. One of the things that we did was we went to the cat market or GAT. I'm sure many of you know what GAT is, it's, uh, for, but for those who don't, it's a, a legal, legal, not illegal, a legal opioid. And it's taken the whole country over. It's, in fact, it's replaced uh, Yemen's once world dominant coffee industry. Um, all the fields now have been given over to GAT, unfortunately. And this that you see here is a covered GAT market. Uh, I have to say it was very, this was the most intimidating I felt, partly of course, because we were so tense from uh, all the piracy around us, but also because they were selling guns out the back of pickup trucks. Um, so this explains why I don't really have too many photos of this place, but I, I, I thought I would just put this in here and just show you. I mean, okay, a lot of them are chewing cat, but uh, look at the grinning faces there. They were wonderful people, and I have to say our fears were were completely unfounded. But ignoring what's going on at the moment in, in Aden and in Yemen, uh, CAT really does dominate the lives of the people there. Uh, they think that 90% of the male population chew it three to four hours a day. Uh, at least 50% of the female adult population chew it. Uh, some say it's, it's even more than that. Um, when we were there, we were warned if you want any work done on the boat or you need any spare parts fixing, get it done before lunchtime. Because although the shops stayed open until the end of the day, by lunchtime, the shop owner was found sitting behind his counter, chewing on the green leaves with his friends and you couldn't get any work done, unfortunately. In the late afternoon, what would happen is they would drag out these iron four poster beds and these benches where the men just chatted and just sat lazily uh, until the dark. I even saw children as young as 10, 11, 12, up alleyways chewing it. It's really sad. It's, um, it's a dichotomy really, because despite the cat and despite what's going on now with the political situation in Yemen uh, and all the news headlines that we see and the war and the terror, uh, the people of Aden were probably the most delightful people we had met to date. And I, it just, I get frustrated when I see on the news, uh, you know, the people painted in a certain way and I just want to shout at the television, not everyone is like that because they aren't. Despite our geographic and our cultural differences, we are quite similar. And people in Aden need their tires changed on their car uh, as much as uh, we do in the UK. And I think this is perhaps the biggest lesson that I learned that there are some universal truths, and that is that everyone wants food on the table. Everyone wants security for their family, a roof over their heads. And I think when you start ingratiating yourself with the local people, albeit with you know, a language barrier, we start to understand that we are quite similar. And I think understanding this helps remove some of the preconceptions that we have of these places. And on the tail of that, of course, it allows us to relax more uh, as photographers as well. My biggest regret, sadly, is that I didn't take any more photos of this place, which is a shame. But uh, of course, piracy was at the forefront of our minds. It just dominated our entire time that we were there. And really, it was a, just a, a race to get away from this area. But that all changed in India. And this is where my photography stepped up a gear. And this is where I started taking my photography more seriously and also taking more of an interest in the people that we were photographing. And although we didn't know it at the time, we ended up spending three years there, which afforded us plenty of time to delve more deeply uh, into India's cultural delights. Up until this point, as you saw, we were just taking photos of passers-by, but um, that changed in India and it's where we would slow down and stop and chat with people. 
This woman, uh, she was actually printed in the uh, latest Travel Lock magazine. You may have seen it. She's actually a, a Harijan from Gauhati in Assam in northeast India. Um, I didn't want to chat politics when I start talking about India, but uh, this is well documented. If you don't know what a Harijan is, you may have heard the term a Dalit. She's a Dalit. Uh, if you don't know what a Dalit is, you will almost certainly have heard of the untouchables. Gandhi called them the children of God, the people of God, the Harijans. I only mention this because I like the contrast between her being this downtrodden, and I use that in inverted commas because that's how Dalit almost translates, a downtrodden, contrasted against her very regal demeanour. And she was very happy to chat to us as well. And she just stopped and uh, this was in a very dimly lit uh, back stairwell in a tiny little housing tenement. It was just nice to be able to chat to her. But if you're not familiar with India, it is an assault on all five senses. Uh, this is a typical photo of an Indian street. It was taken in Anakulam in South India. Uh, you can see the dhotis that the men are wearing. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But there wasn't a single time that we were in India that we didn't see another person. It's a very populated country. Uh, this photo uh, was taken in Mumbai and we can see a rather enterprising chap has converted his bicycle into a knife sharpening tool center. And uh, this photo here, this is my favorite photo of the Taj Mahal. It's possibly from an angle you haven't seen before, unless you've seen the latest Travelogue magazine. And as we can see, it's women collecting stones from uh, a dry riverbed. I think India is a, it's a little bit like Marmite. You either love it or you hate it. And fortunately, Liz and I just fell in love with it. It's vibrant, crazy, noisy, spiritual, energetic, industrious and beautiful all at the same time. Uh, for example, this is a holy ritual. That's uh, holy as in H-O-L-I. Uh, this is one we came across in the west northwest of uh, India. Uh, we happened to be sharing our accommodation with a group of school children and the kids were encouraged to build bonfires. And then they proceeded to jump through the bonfires. <laughs> I don't ever remember doing this on a school trip myself, um, but the teachers and the adults were all standing around cheering them on. And so the boys queued up one by one to jump through, not one, but two bonfires. Never seen anything like this before. Maybe some of you have who've been to India, but for Liz and myself, this was uh, completely new, never seen anything like it. And we spoke to one of the teachers afterwards who explained that uh, some parts of India, not all, uh, during Holi, they, they jump through fires and it's to represent the triumph of good over evil. So I mentioned Holi, which is the Hindu festival of colour. And it's, of course, no wonder that colour is celebrated in India because it is everywhere. Um, like this family uh, from Gujarat. It's amazing to see because in the south it contrasts beautifully with the lush green tropical uh, vegetation and in the west and the north it contrasts with those desert sands. Uh, this lady is from Anjar which is famous for its uh, dyeing and hand printed fabrics. We spent a bit of time here. We visited these places um, over a few days and so we sort of got to know these people a, a little bit we became quite familiar with them and so we visited and revisited these uh, places and I think because we were doing this so the people became a little bit more relaxed with us as well I think it helps that both Liz and I love fabrics but um, I think just having that sort of familiarity allowed us to get you know really quite close to to you know, some of these people. Uh, this, by the way, is just a guy who's uh, thrashing said hand dyed cloth. Um, and they have to use a lot of water for the bleaching and the dyeing process. But essentially, you know, when we go to a new no location, Liz and I want to understand the way of life. We want to know where they live. And we want to know where the children go to school. This children is also in Gujarat. You can see the 
just off to the left there, the, uh, the washing baths. So when we come across these new lifestyles, these new clothing, this new culture, new foods, we, we just have this big curiosity. We just want to know more. Well, in South India, in Tamil Nadu, we met a goat herder called Cheladuri. And uh, through our driver, who acted as our interpreter, Cheladuri explained that he had broken his ankle while he was tending to the goats in the mountains. You can see the bandage around his foot there. Sadly, he didn't have the money to pay for his medical fees. And neither did the landowner, his employer, pay for his medical fees, which we thought was a bit mean. And uh, he goes on, goes on to explain that the little money he earns from goat herding is barely enough to put food on the table. Now, I have to say at this point, he was not asking for money. He was just being matter of fact. And I think it helped that we had this interpreter there. Uh, uh, he was just a taxi driver, but he spoke English. So we were able to press him and to find, find a bit more about him. And he reciprocated because he started asking about us. He wanted to know what we were up to. Well, when he found out that we live on a sailboat and that we're English and we're Western and that we're traveling around the world, he genuinely asked if we would take his 10 year old son to come and live with us on the boat so that we could give him a better future than what he could give his son. You know, and in one mad crazy moment Liz and I seriously considered it. We didn't of course. But I think this fascination with people first started when we arrived in Mumbai uh, having crossed the Arabian Sea. Mumbai was our first stop and uh, we immediately took a taxi to the Dharavi slums made famous of course by Slumdog Millionaire. Um, it's not very PC these days to call them slums but that's how they're known. It is firmly on the tourist map and I suspect that uh, some of you will have already have been there. If you haven't, I thoroughly recommend it uh, because it was a place that broke more preconceptions. Many of these houses, although they're supposedly slums, have running water, they have electricity. Many of the people work in the city in white collar jobs. And um, if they don't do that, then they're very industrious and will have cottage industries out the back of their houses like this one we see here. We're walking around an area where they specialize in clay pots and we can see them here painted in bright red and drying out in the sun on their front doorstep. Dharavi, I have to say, is on the whole pretty safe, but the tour operators will tell you otherwise, presumably so that you use their services. But the other thing that the tour operators will tell you is that photography is strictly forbidden in Dharavi. Well, I have to say this is absolute hogwash because people loved playing up to the camera. Absolutely loved it. Now, the thing is, these guys here, they may look like they're prattin' around and they are, they're just having fun. But what they don't realise is, is that they're putting me at ease. They're helping me relax. And look, let's face it, when you're having this much fun with a camera, you can't help but relax. And you feed off each other. You become more relaxed, they become more relaxed, they become more accepting and so on. And um, I have to say, there's absolutely no problem with photographing children, parents, like in Africa, they have no problem at all. In fact, quite often they will insist on it. Some of the results may be a little bit contrived, I suppose, as a travel photographs go. But I would suggest that if you find yourself in this situation, leverage it to your advantage. Use these willing subjects uh, to act as your, your warm up because I find that quite often when I go on a photo walk, there is sort of th that first hour when I feel a bit sort of, you know, I need to just loosen up a bit. And so playing around with people like this is just a, a great way to loosen up. When we first started, lots of people, when we photographed them, would ask to see their pictures. But uh, I think with the advent of smartphones, people aren't so interested anymore, but they're still happy to pose for photos, which is always good. So we based ourselves down in Kerala, uh, which is in the southwest, in Cochin or Kochi as it's known. And down here, there's a higher percent of Christians uh, than there is in most other places in India. So Christmas is celebrated with much vigor. Now, there is one marina in India 
and that's where we were based. And it was along a little island called Bulgati Island, which was right opposite the town or the city of Anakalum. Now, you may not have heard of Anakalum, um, but you will almost certainly have heard of Fort Ko Chin, famous, of course, for its Chinese fishing nets. It's a very popular spot, not just for foreign tourists, but for local tourists as well. But it was really, it was Anakalum, the city, where all the industry was really, ha well, most of the industry was happening. There were very few tourist spots there, um, but there's lots to take in. And during my time there, I hooked up with a group of Indian photographers, a group of young lads and girls. There were probably up to 20 of us. I was the only foreigner there, and I was the only person in my, what, 30s at the time, 40s maybe. Uh, but they were all young, and they were all enthusiastic. And so we'd meet up once every two weeks. I just came across them on Facebook and got in touch with them. And it was just a great way to, first of all, get to know local people. Secondly, to hang out with other photographers. And thirdly, to feed off their enthusiasm as well. Um, so I do recommend doing that if ever you spend you know, a particular amount of time somewhere. It was also during this time that, of course, Mike Longhurst came out to visit. I alluded to this in the magazine article. Um, I'd met Mike online and he was a very good critic, let's say. Uh, he was always telling me off for chopping people's feet off or lampposts sticking out of people's heads. But uh, I took everything on board. Uh, so I was delighted when Mike said that he would love to come out and visit with his wife, Gabby, which is basically what Mike did. And it was really nice just having a, a mentor there in the flesh, because I think sometimes when I'm on the boat, I do feel a bit cut off. Of course, nowadays we have the internet, we have good connection like this, but back then in India, the connection was expensive and not very good. So to have Mike around, it was, it was great because up until this point, I was really just bumbling around and just taking snaps. But after Mike visited, I started to, you know, really take the photography a bit more seriously. One of my favourite spots is the fruit and veg market. I know it's a bit of a cliche with travel photography, but I'm less interested in the bright fruit and veg and far more interested in the, uh, the people at work there. I could just spend all day in this. I mean, this is a huge industrial uh, sized fruit and veg market, um, but I could spend hours there just watching the people at work. You'll see all over, all over India, but certainly all over uh, Cochin, these porters and the market workers and they're work wearing their ubiquitous blue shirt, um, but they're also wearing their dhoti as well. And you can see this guy as he walks past two young men collecting rubbish, which is another cottage industry, actually, rubbish collection. Um, but the dhoti that the guy is wearing, these are very particular to uh, the local people, and they represent quite often a tribe or a location, an area in India. When I was in India, in Fort Cochin, I was given a dhoti by a local Muslim family who came from Fort Cochin. A couple of years later, when we were in the Maldives, uh, we anchored outside a resort island, went ashore, and the waiter who was working there immediately recognised the pattern on my dhoti and said, I know that pattern, that's from my hometown in Fort Cochin. Turns out that's where he came from. So off the back of that, we got some really excellent service and lots of freebies off him. So uh, <laughs> it's a nice little tale there. By the way, if ever you need anything delivered in Kerala, there is always the very busy Kerala parcel service. So I said Fort Cochin was a popular tourist spot, but quite a lot of my photography was away from those sorts of tourist areas. And this was really because we met a local man called Naza, and he was a, a rickshaw driver and a boatman. And we got to know Naza very well. He lived in the tiny Muslim quarters called uh, Silata Parambu which is a bit of a mouthful, but if you look closely, you can just see the signpost behind this lady crouching with cats and chickens. You can see Salata Parambu, that's one of Naz's neighbours. This neighbourhood was tiny, it was a little quadrant of about 30, 40 houses, but Naz was very proud of his home, and he'd frequently refer to his home as my country. And we got to know him very well, uh, we got to know his family very well, his wife Sakina would 
frequently cook from her tiny little kitchen, which is barely bigger than the galley on our own sailboat. All around this little quadrant, some of those buildings were restaurants. So NASA was able to get us access to go into the kitchens and watch food being prepared on an industrial scale. So NASA taught us a lot, not just about India and not just about his country, but just how generous people can be to a fault. He was welcoming without wanting anything in return. And he wasn't just a friend, he had a massive impact on our travels there. We meet these kind of people in every country we go to. They're quite rare, but um, they just help give our encounters meaning. A little anecdote, by the way, Liz wanted me to include this. The confusion of cultures can work both ways. Uh, Naza asked Liz why there were so many Japanese prostitutes in my country and we were completely baffled and had no idea what he was talking about. It turned out there were a, a load of Chinese tourists who were coming to visit and they were wearing their bikinis on the beach. And NASA had never seen anything like this before and just made the assumption that they were working women. <laughs> Needless to say, I have to say, Liz and I now both cover up Liz, especially when we go to uh, anywhere new, we will always cover up just to show some respect. So you will never see Liz's bare shoulders. And I tend to always wear a shirt as well, which I think helps. Before we leave Cochin, just quickly wanted to introduce you to the Coracle people. These guys we used to see paddling past our boat uh, in the marina every day. Sometimes you would get up to six people living on one of these things. These guys basically lived under a bridge and they used the shade of the bridge to sort through their nets to dry their coracles. I did a whole project on these guys. I had loads of photos. I did interviews with them and sadly I lost all of the photos. This was one of the problems back then. Internet was expensive so uploading to the cloud wasn't a thing and uh, we didn't have the kind of power that we have now on the boat, so I couldn't run servers and hard drives to back up my photos. So a little bit gutted about that. Anyway, we spent three years in India. It's a long time to spend there. We used Esper as the base. We'd go off for a week and then we'd come back, recuperate and go off again. And we covered the usual tourist spots. Uh, this one is from Kolkata. It sums up India nicely. I think a bit of spirituality, the, the hazy sun and of course, rather a lot of rubbish. But India is a very easy place to get around. Uh, the train system is run with military precision and everyone, every local is always willing to help. But it's also not too difficult to get off the beaten track, which is what we like to do. And one of the things that we did was to get involved in charities. And we found that getting involved in charities really helps you get up close and personal with the people that they are helping. Uh, one example is the Mondo Foundation in the Himalayan uh, part of India. Uh, and this charity organisation would build schools, build schools for the school children who lived in the mountains, who literally had to travel miles to get to class, even though they had no electricity. Well, our friend Amy had uh, volunteered with them and she put us in touch with one of the families that uh, helped run the organisation. And that family put us up for a, a few days. Uh, they were based just outside of Darjeeling, which is uh, where this is photographed. This is uh, Darjeeling in West Bengal. The north of India, I should say, and the south of India are two very different areas. It's like the difference between the UK and Turkey, and it's about the same distance. Uh, after three years, we'd often get asked why we never learn Hindi. And we had to explain, of course, that Malayalam was the language that they spoke in Kerala, not Hindi. Uh, fortunately though, English is the common language, so we were uh, able to get around quite easily. In Joppa, we met uh, a guy called Govind, and he told us all about his mother and the terrible ordeal she had with domestic abuse. And so he set up the Sambali Trust and, and helps victims of domestic abuse. And he brings girls, gets girls out of their situation and brings them to the safety uh, of uh, his place in Jodhpur and uh, basically gets them to learn a trade so they can become independent. 
we spent a lot of time with Govind. Uh, again, we we interviewed him. We we even stayed in his in his house. Um, so we really got to know them and, and also got to understand the uh, the women of the Sambali Trust. By the way, I'm not telling you that we're getting involved in charities to be virtuous. That, that's not the reason. It's just because getting in involved in charities just helps us understand the people that they are helping um, just a little bit more. And even if we don't get involved directly, we tend to go to the non-profit organisations, a bit like this one, which is the Tibetan uh, Refugee Self-Help Centre in Darjeeling. Basically, these organisations are giving people a, a chance and uh, an education and a job. And because we take an interest in the products that they are producing, they are happy for us to, to photograph them. The Tibetan Refugee Self-Help Centre uh, helps up to about 130 Tibetan families now, um, primarily for the sick and the elderly. But uh, I think it helps that we love all the handicrafts that uh, they make as well. Uh, needless to say, our boat is full of memorabilia from, uh, from India. You don't need a guide to go off the beaten track. I mean, India is pretty well documented. I think the key thing is just to spend some days there and to become familiar with the place and the people. Uh, this lady is from the Missing Tribe. Uh, you may have heard of them. They live on the island of Majuli, which is apparently the world's largest river island. Uh, this is in the northeast of Assam. Basically, they're known as the river people because um, during the wet season, they have to contend with flooding, which is why they live in uh, stilted houses. And the houses, by the way, those areas underneath the houses, they accommodate their storage, but also their looms because they're famous uh, for their, their weaving. They're also expert fishermen as well. Uh, these guys also from Majuli. Now, someone asked about which camera I used. I didn't want to talk about photography equipment too much, um, but something happened in Majuli, which was a real useful lesson. And that was one evening I dropped my beloved 28 to 70 2.8L Canon lens, which was a beast of a lens, but it was, I, I took this everywhere. I dropped it and broke it. And of course, being in the middle of Assam, there was nowhere I was going to get it repaired. And the only other lens I had on me was a nifty 50. And from that moment on, pretty much the rest of my photography was taken with a 50 mil. And it was just a lesson in downsizing. I think it really helped to be able to get rid of that excess weight because let's face it, lugging around a full frame DSLR, these big L lenses, it was breaking my back. So it was a real revelation to just be shooting with a 50 mil lens like this one, which, uh, I think this one got came runner up in the, a Wanderlust travel competition many years ago. There is an argument that having smaller gear makes you less intimidating, of course, to local people. I'm not entirely convinced about this. I think a tourist with a camera is a tourist with a camera, but I do think that having smaller a smaller setup really does help you just be a lot more mobile and a lot more nimble. I think I mentioned that Mike introduced me to the Micro Four Thirds format. And so I went back to the UK, bought the Olympus OMD EM5. And for the first time, I was now shooting with a camera in one hand and an off-camera flash uh, in the other. This photo was taken in an acolum. So India taught us a lot about the people, um, not just about fellow human beings, but also as a crucial subject in our photography. Uh, from the lifeguards in Goa that we see here to a mucky building site in Kolkata. My photography is really, it's about the people and going to visit these people and absorbing, understanding, living with them if possible and seeing people as not just something to photograph. I think that's the key thing here. And sadly, there's nowhere to haul out the boat in India, so we had to push on and head south. Uh, we ended up in the Maldives for two months. This photo was taken in Uligamu, the northernmost inhabited island. And if you look really, really carefully, you can see that the lady is looking out at Esper on the horizon there. The Maldives is considered one of the most conservative Muslim countries in the world. And it is one of only six dry countries in the world. And there's a very clear segregation between the resort islands and the local islands. Well, 
naturally Liz and I gravitated towards the local islands. Uh, this photograph was taken south of Marley, the capital, uh, where the school children were putting on a fashion parade for their adoring parents. Anyway, after that, um, we made a failed attempt to cross the equator trying to get to South Africa, which is a story unto itself. So um, we turned around and we sailed the Indian Ocean for 14 days, uh, where we took a battering and the boats took a battering. So when we arrived in Langkawi and settled down, uh, we nipped across the border and uh, we went over to Thailand, in South Thailand, in a place called Satun and spent a year in a Thai boatyard. I'm not going to dwell too much on the photography here because it's a pretty industrial place and it's a story of blood, sweat and tears. This is one of the guys operating the uh, haul out machinery in, in the boatyard. But it was a real cultural awakening for us being in this boatyard. The Thai workers will, will move around. So when they know there's a big project on, like our re boat refit, they will move and relocate to the location. But the boatyard also employs workers from Myanmar, like Tonjan. Uh, she's uh, one of the women that worked on our lovely teak floorboards. Basically, the boatyard arranges for the Myanmese workers to come over. They organize their visas and they actually live in the boatyard within the confines of the boatyard. And they actually rarely leave the community. Uh, this was one of the other boatyard workers. He used to help haul the boat out and he got married. So the boatyard paid for his wedding and his reception, uh, which was held, as you can see, in the boatyard car park. We used to live right opposite, by the way, in the wall to the left. We used to live in a little room just opposite there. And uh, it was a great time to be there because we were living with the locals. Our next door neighbour was Pong, who you can see here, who was our carpenter. He was the chief lead carpenter who worked on our boat. And we spent many an evening getting drunk with him on cheap Thai rum as his wife cooked barbecue squid and his ducks ran around between us not being able to speak a word of Thai and he not a word of English. And yet we spent hours together. Sometimes I'd end up in the back of a pickup truck drinking what tasted like paint stripper with the guys that worked in the machine shop. And by the way, I should add I'm teetotal now, probably because of uh, too much Thai rum. But despite all this, these guys were conscientious, talented and hard grafters. And we worked with them from 8 until 4.30 every day. Uh, we had a team of up to 30 people. We negotiated with suppliers. We traveled to other cities to source materials, uh, dealt with customs and so on. But make no mistake, the Thais and the people from Myanmar have their own way of working. And it's a real steep learning curve for us Farangs, as the Thais call us, uh, the foreigners. And if you're not careful, you could very easily offend them. And we saw this time and time again. Uh, we saw yard workers who would down tools and walk off a job simply because the Western yacht owner had raised his voice or he had told a carpenter who was born with a chisel in, ha in his hand and has been a carpenter since the age of five, told a carpenter how to do his job. And so they were very quick to offend and, and walk off. And you have to be mindful of that. Uh, we also found that money was never an incentive either. We made the mistake of giving our workers a bonus, um, thinking it would incentivize them to work harder, and it didn't. They disappeared for three days. They had money, so they went off and spent it. It was a, it was a learning curve, but of course, in among all this hard work, we did a lot of uh, playing as well, and we basically joined in their festivals. Uh, this is a, uh, an annual kite festival in Satun, which is the town by the boatyard. And if ever you've been to Thailand and you've seen green lights at sea at night on the horizon, those would be the squid fishing boats. Well, we got invited to spend the night aboard one of these boats. So we got to see how the whole thing worked. We spent the night fishing for squid. squid uh, in the morning, we got grouper and we returned to the boatyard with a full catch. And we had a massive barbecue with all of those workers that I'd mentioned previously. And we got invited to... Uh, Things like a buat ceremony, ceremony this is. Uh, again, this is one of the yard workers. And this kind of ceremony is normally only for close family and friends. So it was a real honor to be 
invited along to these kind of things. And I think because we spent, I worked it out, 2,750 hours working and playing alongside these people, we were truly, for the first time, starting to get under the skin of the locals. But by the way, I should say, for those who aren't familiar, we've, we've spent the last 10 years going all over um, this area. Uh, but we spent two years in Malaysian Borneo in the north east corner in Sabah, partly due to COVID, unfortunately. Our plan was to go to the Philippines and Japan, but we couldn't because the borders were closed. The only borders that opened were Indonesia and the situation in Malaysia was getting so horrible that we just had to get out. So we went south instead of going north and we went and discovered this place. It is well known among sailors, uh, but it's called Bohe Dulang. This is actually a stitched uh, drone panorama shot. I can't remember how many images it is, but it looks particularly idyllic, doesn't it? Looks lovely. Well, as if the piracy around the Gulf of Aden wasn't enough, we were now venturing into the Sulu Sea, which is notorious for piracy and even beheadings. So the, the local government, the Malaysian government, insists on putting on a naval escort uh, to go around this part of Malaysia. You have to get special permission to anchor in this particular spot. Um, but I only showed you this because this is where the Bajau Laut lived, the sea gypsies who we met um, in the introduction. And uh, again, this is another drone shot here. And the Bajau Laut have a, again, their history is quite complex and difficult because they predate what we now know as Malaysia and the Philippines. So they've actually been living in these areas when these areas were just sultanates. And of course, because they've now become established countries, uh, the Bajau Laut are effectively stateless. They have no rights to education, to food um, or to medicine. I'm happy to say, actually, the people that we met here uh, found employment on a seaweed processing plant, which was another little um, stilt, stilted platform just out of shot from here. The great thing was, is that while we were there as yachties, having dinghies to access these places, uh, we were able to give them medical supplies. In this particular spot you see here, the little boy had cut his finger. So we were able to give him iodine and plasters. And in return, his father, who you can just see hanging out the window there, climbed up a coconut tree without a rope and cut down a bunch, a lovely bunch of coconuts and gave them in return to the yachties who helped his, uh, his son. It's a shame we couldn't stay longer in these places, but you know, if it's not piracy or if it's not the weather, then um, you've got visa problems as well. So our passage from uh, Sabah down into Indonesia, around Sulawesi, then we had to get to Lombok. We had to do all this all quite quickly because of visa restrictions. And this could be quite frustrating when you found beautiful spots like this one here. Another example is uh, Malanga, and I'd be interested to know if anyone has heard of uh, Malanga. This is in Sulawesi, it's in the northwest corner near Toli Toli, which you may have heard of. And Malanga is famous for its roofs that open up, which you can see here, uh, by a rope and pulley system, and they dry out their foodstuffs in the heat of the sun. And pretty much every building in this village have these opening roofs and it's as far as I understand it is almost completely unique at least to this area it's not yet yet on the tourist trail but I wouldn't be surprised if it does become a UNESCO World Heritage Centre and it was in Malanga actually we were invited to sit with the chief and have uh, lunch with him and we were given bees eggs I don't know if anyone's eaten bees eggs before but they're a delicacy here taken from the hives of uh, bees from the surrounding rainforest. Fish, by the way, is almost always cooked on coconut husk, as you can see here. We see this in a lot of places in Indonesia, but especially in Sulawesi, uh, almost everywhere would cook fish on coconut husks. I'm digressing slightly from the place I wanted to tell you about, but this does bring us nicely onto coconuts because before Malanga on the scooter, we came across this um, coconut processing plant and uh, this specialised in the production of copra, which is the dried meat from coconuts. And you see this all over Southeast Asia, but 
Uh, this entire community was involved in the process, uh, from spitting the coconuts to extracting the oil and uh, drying the flesh. But sadly, of course, at the time I was concentrating on video, not photos. So I have very few photos of the place. And it is somewhere I would like to return to and do a project on. And of course, the great thing is, is that because we got to know that chief in, uh, of the village of Malanga, we got to know people in Tolly Tolly, and you know, they became friends for the two or three weeks we were in Tolly Tolly, for example. Because we know these people, we now have effectively a base, a group of people that we could return to, who I'm sure would be more than happy for us to go back to um, and put us up for the week. And, and even, you know, be able to take all my camera gear because that is unfortunately a luxury, which I don't really have when we're on the boat at uh, anchor. And by the way, this is the last photo from that coconut plantation. Uh, you may have seen this, uh, this is called Thanaka, and it's a paste made from tree bark. Uh, now I thought it was just a sunblock, but apparently it has antibacterial and uh, antifungal properties. And apparently it's even anti-aging, which is why you see a lot of the women in Southeast Asia uh, wearing this on their faces. I mentioned just a moment ago that, uh, you know, getting ashore uh, with all this camera gear is difficult, which is why I tend to just roam with just a single lens. But being at anchor does also provide some great opportunities as well. Now, at the very beginning, I showed a picture of a woman sorting through anchovy. This is another picture from the same village, uh, some women sorting through anchovy. And I was asking, where does the fish come from? How did it get there? Well, it came from a Bagan fishing boat and we just happened to be anchored right next to one. And that is one of the great things about being on the boat. And this led to a whole project on Ejok, which is the village this is based around. And I just wanted to show you a tiny little extract from it. Just before sundown, they arrive at the Bagan by skiff. The first thing Rule does is empty the bilges of water. Before weighing the boat's anchor, a large piece of concrete that's hoisted by hand. Although the boat remains in the bay, it's moved around depending on where they feel there is most fish activity that day. In the fading light, the four crew scamper around the outriggers and prepare the net. Throughout the night, the net is operated twice. It's lowered first at 7pm and raised at 10pm, and then again between 2am and 4am. Each corner of the net is taken to the four corners of the port outrigger before being lowered. With the net lowered, it's now twilight. So the generator is cranked up and the floodlights switched on. Projecting a light onto the surface of the water starts a natural food chain reaction. Plankton is attracted to the light, which attracts fish to eat the plankton and so on. The light also attracts crabs, which had agus scuttling around the rigging with a fishing net. With a few hours to kill, the crew can relax. They'll eat a late dinner, so a large pot of rice is prepared in advance. Cooking utensils are rudimentary, but enough for their needs. The living quarters are cramped. The wooden shack is less than two metres wide and has to accommodate the cooking equipment, electricity for the lights and personal possessions. It also doubles up as a sleeping area. When it's not raining, the crew rotate from inside to outside. This downtime allows them to chat with their wives and children on their phones, or just smoke and drink coffee. And while the fishing nets will be catching small fish to be sold commercially, the crew also do their own fishing for their supper. One of the crew, Agus, straps on a head torch and uses this downtime to prepare his hand line. They spend much of the evening this way, with Agus and Samson fishing from the boat, while Rule uses the outriggers to drop his line. Despite the small area, the shack allows at least two of the crew to sleep, each curled up under a warm blanket as the other two catch a cigarette break. Mastar takes over cooking duties, frying up garlic and chilli in hot oil in preparation for a fried fish supper. Before each haul, the lights are turned off, and with no moon, the crew are now operating in complete darkness, punctuated only by Jamie's camera flash, or, in the case of the second haul, 
a glimpse of dawn. The large net, measuring 9 metres by 9 metres, is hoisted by hand, with the crew taking it in turns to rotate the wooden roller. As the net comes out of the water, lower lights are turned on and Mastar checks the net is closed. The weight of the catch is so big, the entire bagan heels over to port, with the starboard outriggers coming clean out of the water. The net is then dropped onto the boat and the catch spills out across the foredeck. With the lights back on, the crew spend the next hour sorting through the catch. There are different grades of Ikan Terry, but the average price for a box is around 500,000 rupiah. That's around 32 US dollars. The crew's wages are often spent on cigarettes and tobacco. As dawn breaks, birds are attracted to the unwanted fish cast back into the water by the crew, including a white-bellied sea eagle. Okay, so that was uh, a little project that I worked on while we were at this place called Ejok and anchored right next to this bagan. Uh, now, we spent at least two weeks at this place, and I have to say, from a touristic point of view, it's completely unremarkable. And in fact, the island of Sumbawa, where this was recorded on, is probably the least touristic when it's got Flores to the right and it has Lombok and Bali to the left. And yet, as a travel photographer, you don't have to look far to find you know, interesting subjects. Now, of course, the great thing about spending all the time with these guys was that uh, we would then start to get to know the people in the village as well. We were able to meet up with this lady who was called Diana. She was the, pretty much the only person that actually spoke good English in Ijok, the town of Ijok, or the village of Ijok. And she learned English when she was a student, when she was a child. But for some reason, the local government has decided to pull English from the curriculum. So she has decided to volunteer to help teach English. So when we got chatting to her, she said, well, why don't you come along and see one of my lessons or maybe even take one of my lessons. So, so we agreed to do this. I think word had obviously got around that we were about to come up to the school because as we entered the gates, we were approached by literally a hundred screaming school children all vying for selfies. They were extremely excited. It was just, just, it was just amazing to see. It was, it was heart melting. It really was. Well, Liz and I took uh, a lesson and it was it was really good fun. I remember uh, to punish the naughty boys, Deanna made them dance for 10 seconds in front of the class as a kind of uh, a fun humiliation. Uh, it was good fun to see. But here's the thing. Two months later, Deanna sent me a WhatsApp message and uh, she said, are you coming back? Because since your visit, there has been an uptick in the number of students interested in learning English. And bear in mind, this is, you know, outside school hours. And I think this simple anecdote just shows how we can exchange cultures. And it's really just a case of us giving time to the students and then giving us unfettered access to their community and their fishing way of life. Fishing, by the way, is a big theme, obviously, both on board Esper, but just generally as a, as a sailor, you're, of course, surrounded by it. And when we enter a new country, it's normally fishermen who are the first people we see. And uh, the guys pictured here had actually helped us in to a tricky anchorage in the, uh, the mangroves. There's definitely some kind of, there's an innate camaraderie among you know, those of us who share the oceans. And I hope one day that uh, I can put together a, a project on fishing and I think being on a boat is one of those times when it gives us the edge in terms of getting access to those locations but the flip side is is that quite often we miss the golden hour I got it here but quite often we'll miss the golden hour so a lot of my photography ends up being uh, during the midday sun or uh, in the case of this night shot in Jakarta at night time I love low light photography uh, I love nighttime photography uh, it, it is one of my passions. Uh, the tropics actually is a very good time to be photographing at night time because it's so hot during the day, the people sensibly hide away. So sometimes you get your best shots um, at night time. It's quite often it's the most active time. 
And of course, you know, as cameras get better, mirrorless cameras perform so much better in low light, denoising software, that kind of thing. It means that now that we can take, well, I'm taking photos now at one over two hundredth of a second and even stopping down in very low light situations. Despite our lifestyle and meeting all these wonderful, strange and weird cultures that are kind of out there, we both, Liz and I, love cities as well. And we just love wandering around them. There's nothing I like more than wandering around the city at night time with just Google Maps and my camera as, as company. There's something about being anonymous that a city provides that, you know, as travellers on a boat, we simply can't get when we go to some of these uh, unique locations. And sometimes I like to be invisible. Just to conclude then, I think as you will have seen that quite often the photography that I'm taking is as a, as a result of uh, leveraging the friendship that, uh, that we make. A good example is uh, a guy called Johnny who we met uh, also on Sumbawa in a town called Bima. He was actually a an upholsterer but he was unofficially a tour guide and he introduced us to his brightly painted street that he lived on that you see pictured here this is one of his neighbors and I think just you know having that friendship with Johnny gave us a it gave us a green card it meant that the locals knew that I knew him so it just meant that I was able to move around between locations and uh, and not to not have any bother at all and, and to feel quite relaxed about photographing. And, and that is because we have used um, the friendship to our advantage. Of course, the other thing is, is that in certainly in Asia, they don't have the same kind of boundaries that we do in the UK or in the West. You know, you can walk into people's gardens and no one bats an eyelid. And so sometimes some of the photography I'm doing here, I think would be more difficult to do in the West. I think though, I should be realistic here because the one thing that has really helped my cause is the kindness of people and their generous nature. And especially in Southeast Asia, it's how they welcome strangers. It's not something that I take for granted, I have to say in terms of my photography. So. You know, I've learned to read body language. I've learned to understand when people don't want their photo taken. And by the way, this woman was quite happy for me to take her photo, although we did share a giggle when she realised I was photographing her great big bloomers. But I think the most important lesson really is it's about attitudes and being positive and having that inquiring mind and also maintaining a, a friendly demeanour. And, you know, you can do that with a camera. As long as you're smiling, uh, nodding and making eye contact, just showing people that you're there. I think this just helps remove some of the barriers that we may have. I think it also helps that I have a childlike playfulness. I'm a bit like the children in this shop from The Missing Tribe. I'm like the kids in this picture. You know, I, I like to play around while the, uh, the adults are doing the work. But I think also... Being on a sailboat, that does help because it has forced us outside of our comfort zone. Basically, if you can contend with anything nature throws at you out at sea, I think you're in good stead for uh, doing photography on land. And quite often a bad passage uh, or even after um, just a bad anchorage for the night, there's nothing more relaxing than seeing uh, a local person smile at you and it just just really helps us relax and I think that traveling by boat has helped break down some of these preconceptions that um, maybe we used to have and I think the other lesson that I've learned is just not to is to take people's opinions with a pinch of salt to not take their opinions literally and to experience places ourselves and to make up our own opinions based on our own experiences uh, rather than listening to other people. I thought I would end on a massive cliche and I make no apology for this cliche. Uh, this is courtesy of these two young students from the Mondo Foundation who we saw earlier in Darjeeling. Uh, they're taking part in an event at a sports day which we got invited to. But the cliche is thus. We find that time and time again in our travels that despite 
the geographical and the cultural differences, when we lift the blindfold, we find that we are all the same.